Hi everyone, welcome to Mosaic Church Online. Today, we are wrapping up our series, Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. And today's question is the relationship question. It's a question that will bring inescapable clarity to just about every relational decisions you'll ever come across. We do have an important announcement though. Sometime at the end of this month, we're going to take the church out of the church in our first ever pop-up church event. So if you're in Dubai, you don't want to miss that. So I hope that you stick around for further announcements on the location and further details about this event. But for now, let us worship together. OJ and the band, take it away.
Hey everybody, the secret to great relationships is asking one very important question. This question pays the path to relational health. It's a question that brings inescapable clarity to just about every relational decision you'll come across. It's a question everyone should ask and one all Jesus followers must ask. We'll find out that question today as we continue our series, Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. So today we're wrapping up our series, Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. And the big idea in this series is the often overlooked relationship between good questions and good decisions. Good questions actually set us up to make good decisions. And I'm convinced that if you will ask, if you'll answer honestly, and then act on those answers to these five questions we're talking about in this series, you will make better decisions and consequently, you'll live with fewer regrets. Your life will be better, and the people who look to you and depend on you, their lives will be better as well. Because we aren't the only people impacted by our decisions, right? And we're not the only people impacted by our regrets either. So here's a quick review. The first question we explored was the integrity question. Am I being honest with myself? Am I being honest with myself, really? You will never get to be where you want to be until you're honest about where you currently are. The most difficult people to lead is definitely always the person in the mirror. So whenever you're making a decision of any consequence, before you commit to an option, ask yourself, am I being honest with myself? Am I being honest with myself about, about why I'm doing this? Choosing this, purchasing this, calling him back, calling her back. You owe it to yourself to be honest. The second question was the legacy question. The legacy question is, what story do I want to tell? When the decision that you're in the process of making right now, whether it be relational, financial, academic, professional, when the decision you're in the process of making right now, when it's nothing more than a story you tell, what story do you want to tell? Make it a story you're proud to tell. Be the person who exercises self-control, not the person who lost control. Use your superpower. We've talked about that. Your respondability, that's your superpower. And you decide your story one decision at a time. Because as it's far as it's up to you, you write the story of your life one decision at a time. I want you to write a good story. Our third question was the conscious question. Is there a tension that deserves my attention. You're considering an option and you're thinking about doing something specific. You're about to pull the trigger on the decision and everybody's nodding. Everything looks good on paper, but there's just something about it that it just doesn't seem right. Something that you can't put your finger on. When that happens, pause and pay attention to that tension. Now, last time we were together, we explored the fourth question, the maturity question. And the maturity question is, what is the wise thing to do? In light of your past experience, in light of your current circumstances, in light of your future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing for you to do? An option may be legal or acceptable or permissible, but not exactly immoral, but is it wise? Remember this, a decision. A decision can be not wrong and not wise at the same time. Unwise decisions, remember this, unwise decisions are gateway decisions. They lead to regret. In fact, your greatest regret, your greatest regret was preceded by a series of unwise decisions. How do I know that? Because it's true for all of us, me included. The decisions that preceded your greatest regret, they probably weren't wrong. They weren't illegal, but looking back, they were terribly, terribly unwise. So decide wise. Today we're going to unpack our final question, the relationship question. By now, it should be clear that the thing that makes these questions clarifying also makes them have the potential of being a bit terrifying. 
And I say terrifying because, well, we usually know the answers to these questions before we even finish asking the question right. And once we know, we can't unknow. And once we know, we feel accountable. Now our fifth and final question may be the most clarifying and thus the most terrifying question of all. This will probably be the question you're most tempted not to ask and not to answer honestly. So once again, a disclaimer. You don't have to do anything with your answer, but you owe it to yourself to know the answer, right? What you won't know can hurt you. In the case of our final question, what you don't know or refuse to know has the potential to hurt you where you have the potential to hurt the most in your most cherished relationships. Now, when you think about your future, you don't envision yourself alone, right? I mean, when you think about your future, there's probably somebody beside you or perhaps that somebody's already beside you. Our final question will help you keep them there. In fact, this question has the potential to enhance the quality of every single one of your relationships. It has the power to restore and heal broken relationships. It has the power to rekindle romance, to restore what was lost. But before the big reveal, another disclaimer. Unlike our other four questions, this question does not come with a guaranteed ROI, return on investment. There may be no tangible, measurable, or even noticeable returns with this one. And the reason is this. Our final question is not about making your life better. It's about making someone else's life better, which may make your life better. But, and this is the payoff, our final question positions you to make the world better. So, here we go. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he hinted that something new was on the horizon, something designed to actually replace much of what, what, most of which was in place in first century Judaism. All of his hints, his parables, were designed to create a sense of expectation in the minds and hearts of his first century followers. So when he entered Jerusalem for his final visit and what would be his final Passover meal, crowds lined the streets to welcome him. Their expectations were political, regal, messianic. They knew something was up and he had their undivided attention, but they did not understand his ultimate intention. So on the night of his arrest, he gathers his 12 apostles for what would be his final Passover meal. And he made his intentions clear. To begin with, he announced that he was leaving and that was a downer for sure. And he was, and they were probably confused. I mean, why would he leave now? We were on the cusp of a revolution, right? I mean, the kingdom of Israel was about to be restored. And then he laid it out. He said this, a new command I give you. A new command, they must have thought. We don't need a new command. We already have 600 plus commands. And why was he talking about new commands? We need to make plans, right? He continued and he said this, a new command I give you, and here it is, love one another. Now, that really wasn't all that new, but Jesus really wasn't all that through either. He wasn't commanding them to feel something. He was commanding them to do something. And what came next? Well, it was unthinkable, but what came next changed the world. And what came next has the potential to change your world. What Jesus said next is the basis for our fifth and final question. Here's what he said. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. As I have loved you, he defines it there. So you must love one another. That was new. Apparently doing for others what one hoped others would do for them in return was so last century. Jesus tells his followers they are to do unto others as he has done unto them. Now, this was extraordinarily personal for the men seated around the table that night. I mean, us as modern Christians read, as I have loved you, we immediately think of the cross, but they didn't. They thought back over the previous three years, perhaps each man in the room was transported back to some particular moment in time where Jesus had loved him particularly well. I mean, he could have worked his way around the room, right? I mean, one by one, he could have said to each of those 12 men, 
love as I have loved you. Extend to everyone you meet the same grace and the same forgiveness I extended personally to you. And he could have added this, and gentlemen, if you think you've seen me love, tighten your sandals, you ain't seen nothing yet. Little did they know that on the following day, he would put on a demonstration of love that would take their breath away. Because the following day, he would give his life away. He continued, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, here's the thing, and this is so easy for us to miss. This new command brand of love was to serve as the unifying and defining characteristic for his new movement, the church. His new command was to serve as the standard against which all of their behavior was to be measured. They were to love as he had loved. They were to love as he would love, which means this, that following Jesus would not be about looking for ways to get closer to a God who dwelled up there or out there somewhere. Jesus' followers would demonstrate their devotion to God by putting the person next to them in front of them. Jesus' followers would authenticate their love for God by, not by looking up. They would authenticate their devotion to God by looking around, by loving the people around them like Jesus did. And in an unprecedented move for a religious figure, Jesus didn't leverage his equality with God or even his messianic authority to stir his followers to action. He leveraged his love. In other words, Jesus didn't anchor his new command to his divine right as king. He anchored it to his own personal sacrificial love. Why would his disciples obey this new command? Why would they obey his new command to love? Really? Because he first loved. They were to do unto others as Jesus had already done and was about to do unto them. Hours later, again, Jesus would stage a demonstration of love that not only took their breath away, it took their excuses away as well, along with ours. Now think about it. A new command I give you to love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Jesus' all-encompassing command was far less complicated than the current system, but it would turn out to be far more demanding as well. There would be no loopholes, no workarounds in this new brand of love. And that brings us to our last and final question, the relationship question. The question that honestly pays the path to our relational health, the question that lays a foundation for mutually beneficial relationships. It's a question that brings inescapable clarity to just about every relational decision you'll ever bump up against. Our final question actually takes us to the heart of Jesus' new covenant command. Question number five is this. What does love require of me? What does love require of me? This clarifying and yes, at times terrifying question should stand guard over our consciousness. It should serve as the guide, a signpost, a compass, as we navigate the unavoidable complexities of relationships. It should inform how we date, how we parent, how we boss, how we manage, and how we coach. This question, think about it, this question gives voice to God's will for us on issues where the Bible is silent. Well, the Bible doesn't say there's anything wrong with, you fill in the blank. This question closes all of those loopholes. It exposes our hypocrisy. It is so simple, but is inescapably demanding. Now, I imagine you're smart enough to know what love requires of you most of the time. But just in case, if love one another is not specific enough, the New Testament is actually full of real-world applications of what Jesus' new command brand of love looks like in the real world. In fact, the authors of the New Testament didn't add to Jesus' new command. They simply told us how to apply it. And the Apostle Paul, he provides with the clearest applications. In his letters to the Christians living in the Roman province of Galatia, we call it the Book of Galatians, he actually insists that when it comes to relationships, here's what love requires. It requires 
kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's what love looks like in the real world. When in doubt, max those out. The interesting thing is, that was Paul's short list. His most detailed description of what love looks like and acts like is actually found in his first letter to Christians who lived in Corinth. Now this list is so familiar, I'm not sure it creates so much as a ripple in the consciences of most modern readers. And it is, that is so unfortunate because this is the gold standard according to Paul. What does love require of us? Paul says, here's what love requires of us. Love is patient. It's not pushy. Love requires that I move at your pace rather than demanding or requiring that you move at mine. He says, love is kind. What is kindness? Kindness is love's response to weakness. Kindness is the choice to loan others our strength rather than reminding them of their weakness. It's doing for others what they cannot do in that moment do for themselves. What does love require of us? He says, it does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Love is humble. Love requires us to keep envy and pride from interfering with our ability to celebrate the, law, the success of other people. Love, oh, love allows others to shine. What does love require of us? He says, it does not dishonor others. Love requires us to show honor to others. Love never treats, love never treats another person dishonorably. Love never treats another person disgracefully. Love never treats another person indecently. Love doesn't create regret. Think about it. Honor. Honor is at the heart of every satisfying relationship. And then he says this. It's not self-seeking. In other words, love is not selfish. Love puts the interest in the needs of the other person first. Think about that. That alone, that one idea alone would solve most relationship problems, wouldn't it? Then he says this, love is not easily angered. In other words, love is not easily stirred up or provoked. Love absorbs. Love puts the other person's story ahead of their own. He says, love keeps no record of wrongs. Love is not a scorekeeper. Love conveniently forgets the bad and love conveniently elevates the good. Come on, forgiving and pretending to forget, you know this, Forgiving and pretending to forget is your best bet. To do otherwise is a power play. Think about this. When somebody holds your past over you, who's in the elevated position? Love is not about powering up. Love is about stepping down like Jesus did. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in what's true. In other words, love doesn't enjoy catching the other person doing the wrong thing. Again, Love celebrates when they get it right. And he concludes with this big idea. He says, love always protects. In other words, love requires us to do everything in our power to protect or guard the relationship. Translated, love doesn't smuggle harmful things into the relationship. Just the opposite. Love keeps harmful things out of the relationship. Love doesn't seek to win arguments. Love seeks to protect the relationship. Besides, come on, nobody ever wins an argument, especially when family's involved. I've seen too many parents win all the arguments and then lose their kids in the process. Paul wraps up his list with this. Love always trusts, always trusts. Love chooses a generous explanation when the other person's doesn't meet our expectations. Love requires us to believe the best while choosing to downplay the rest. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. Now, that's quite a list, isn't it? But that's what love requires, and that's why the fifth question is not for the faint of heart. But consider this. Aren't the adjectives and the verbs in Paul's list, aren't they the very thing that you hope for or even expect from the people closest to you? your spouse, your fiance, your, your parents, your kids. I mean, if these are the behaviors we're consciously or even subconsciously expect from the folks around us, shouldn't they be required of us as well? So what does love require of you? It may require you to pause this video, get up out of your chair, 
walk into the kitchen or to the bedroom and apologize. Go on, I'll wait. <laughs> it may require you to pick up your phone and rebuild a bridge you burned down with your logic and your sarcasm. You were right, but being right wasn't what love required of you, was it? You may need to write a letter. You may need to rewrite an email. You may need to invite someone to coffee and no, the other party may not be interested in what love requires of you. They may not have no interest at all in what love requires of them either, but that's okay. Love requires that you just keep asking. So with all of that as a backdrop, here's our fifth and final decision, should you choose to decide it. Decision number five the relationship decision. I will decide with the interest of others in mind. I will decide with the interest of others in mind. Now, like you, my views on a variety of topics have evolved or really completely changed throughout the years. This includes my views on parenting, marriage, money, just to name a few. We meant well, but then, you know, just life happened, kids happened. Tragedy struck, we grew. We changed, but while our knowledge and beliefs are changing, one thing remained constant. That one thing is love. Love fills the gaps. Love reduces the friction created by my limited insight and knowledge. I mean, there's so many things, honestly, that I, I don't know. There are things I'll never understand, but here's the thing. My ignorance and your ignorance my ignorance does not impede my capacity to put other people first. So while I'm not always sure what to believe, I'm almost always knowing what love requires of me. And I bet you do too. So next time you find yourself driving home, having that imaginary conversation with your husband or your wife or your son or your daughter, next time you find yourself driving to work, having that imaginary conversation with your boss, that manager, that challenging employee, pause and ask yourself this question. What does love require of me? So that's it. Those are the five questions to ensure that you make better decisions and live with fewer regrets. Remember, good questions. Good questions lead to better decisions and your decisions determine the direction and the quality of your life. Your decisions create the story of your life. So come on, write a good one. And remember this, your current regrets, look, and we've all got them. Your current regrets are only part of your story. They don't have to be the story. Your past should remind you, but it does not have to define you. So tell yourself the truth. Even when the truth makes you feel bad about yourself, explore rather than ignore your conscience. Raise your standard of living from what's legal, acceptable, permissible to what's wise and then do what love requires of you. That changed the world once, and perhaps it will again. But even if it doesn't change the world, it will certainly change yours. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for these powerful, powerful words from Jesus. I pray that it would in fact set the standard for what we say and how we treat the people around us. And Father, for the man or the woman or the student who's listening or watching this right now, who knows in their heart they need to turn to the person beside them to go up and get up and walk into the other room because that's what love requires of them. Give them the courage to submit to your Lordship in this moment and obey. And Father, I do pray that all of, the, all of us would live a story worth telling and a story that at the end ultimately points to you and gives you glory in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Thanks, Jeremy. What a great question to finish off our series. So let me ask you, what has been your favorite question amongst all of the five ones that we've discussed the past five weeks? Which question actually spoke to you the most? Is it the relationship question, the legacy, integrity question, maturity question? I will have to think about my answer. But I hope you find today's content very helpful for you. And I hope you have a great weekend. God bless everyone.